Yo, what's up, guys? Welcome to Digital Arts USMLE. Man, I really need to like, change up my intro. This just sucks. Yo, what's up, ladies? Welcome to Digital Arts USMLE. All right, never mind, that just sucked. So today we will continue our microbiology journey and move into the streptococcus organisms. Starting out with streptococcus pneumoniae, its characteristics, virulence factors, the organ systems affected by it, and the treatment options based on the type of infection. And while we're at it, we can cover some of the mechanisms of action based on the antibiotics we use against it. So what is streptococcus pneumoniae? It is a gram-positive streptococci and a facultative anaerobic organism. It is catalase negative, so it can't break down hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen. And this is a test we use to distinguish staphylococcus from streptococcus organisms. We can then use bile esculent auger, also known as BEA, which differentiates streptococci from enterococci. Bile esculent auger contains 4% bile, which inhibits the growth of most gram positives, along with glycoside esculine, and that's just like a sugar, and ferric citrate. If the bacteria can break down glycoside esculine into esculetin and dextrose, then we can detect it, because the esculetin will react with the ferric citrate to produce a charcoal type black color. So in this case, streptococcus pneumonia pretty much gets like raped by the bile, so yeah, it's BEA negative, so that makes our life pretty easy. Under the microscope, after staining, it looks like a bunch of lancet-shaped diplococci everywhere. They can be longer, but they usually don't stretch out to be too long. It's also alpha hemolytic, which in the books means partially lysed, but you can't really partially lyse something. So basically what it means is that it's oxidizing the heme groups in the blood, and it's making the agar look green. And you can see that from the picture. We eventually need to distinguish streptococcus pneumoniae from the viridan streptococci, and we can do that with the optocin susceptibility test. Optocin is just a toxic chemical, and it pretty much rapes streptococci, especially streptococcus pneumoniae, compared to the other streptococcus species. So it is sensitive, aka susceptible, to the test, and it won't grow. And we know this by seeing the zone of inhibition surrounding the paper optocin disc. There's also another test called the Lancefield grouping test, which groups bacteria from the category of A through S based on the type of carbohydrate composition of the bacterial antigens that are found on their cell walls. So for streptococcus pneumonia, it actually has no Lancefield antigens, so it doesn't even get grouped. So that's a good thing for us at least. So there are 92 different serotypes of streptococci pneumonia. Yeah, I know sucks. But uh, one of the ways that we can select for the pathogenic type is by using the quelling reaction test. So we don't really need to do all the other tests. So this test is pretty fast and it's definitive. We basically have a specific antibody which can bind to the capsule of streptococci pneumonia. And you can see like this sharply demarcated halo which represents the edge of the capsule. You can see it looks a little bit swollen but it's actually just a change in the refractive index. So the light transmitted through the capsule is a little bit brighter and we can see the actual pneumococcal organism inside. So streptococcus pneumonia has multiple virulence factors such as its polysaccharide capsule. So being an encapsulated organism just helps prevent it from being like eaten by our white blood cells. And the capsule also has a negative charge which prevents phagocytosis. So that's why we need either IgG or opsonins like complement component 3B aka C3B, to tag and help on opsonization of the organism. And this just really helps it eat the organism faster, like 4,000 times faster. They also have IgA protease, which pretty much cleaves IgA along with pneumolysin O. And pneumolysin O is just released when the bacteria dies and it pretty much screws up everything from like the respiratory burst to complement fixation. And it can damage the respiratory epithelium as well. So yeah, it's pretty bad. So yeah, streptococcus pneumonia is number one, meaning that it's the number one cause of typical pneumonia, the number one cause of adult meningitis, and the number one cause of otitis media, as well as sinusitis. So typical pneumonia usually presents with a fever, chills, they can have a productive cough as well. So it just means that they're coughing out phlegm. And in the case of streptococcus pneumonia, their phlegm is gonna be like this rusty colored sputum, which is like a light red or pinkish sort of tint to it. And it can also cause lobar consolidation, which you can see on x-ray. And this usually happens in the lower lobes. 
Just remember, Streptococcus pneumoniae does cause 66% of bacterial pneumonias. So yeah, it's like a pretty high number. So typical pneumonias are generally caused by extracellular microbes, which cause a T helper 2 humoral response. These T helper type 2 lymphocytes release interleukins, which bring neutrophils, B cells, and antibodies, as well as complement to all attack the bacteria in the lung parenchyma. And the lung parenchyma is just the portion of the lung that's involved in gas exchange. So like the alveoli, the alveolar ducts, and so on. So if the patient has all these cells and pus, which is just dead neutrophils, along with the inflammation around the alveolar wall, they'll eventually cough up like a ton of sputum and crap, and their lungs will be consolidated. So on physical exam, we can hear crackles and decreased breath sounds on auscultation, as well as dull thuds when we tap the chest. So dullness to percussion, which just means that there's fluid in the lungs. Also during auscultation, we can ask the patient to say E, and it will sound like they're saying A. And this is known as egophony. So besides chest x-ray, you're gonna go down to the lab and be like, yo guys, run some blood work for me and check out the cultures. And yeah, so you'll probably see a slight drop in their O2 saturation as well because of all the fluid building up in their lungs. Plus their alveolar are inflamed. So we can go over a little bit of physiology and by Fick's law of diffusion, we can see that the surface area has decreased and the thickness has increased like crazy. Since the denominator is bigger than the numerator, the rate of diffusion will be decreased overall. So for treatment, it depends on how bad it is and whether or not we need to admit them to the hospital. And there's a quick mnemonic that most people use. It's called CURB65. So CURB65 is used for predicting the mortality of community-acquired pneumonia, not hospital-acquired pneumonia. It's based off of five criteria. Each criteria represents one point for a total of five points. These criteria are confusion, so they're not like alert and oriented times three. Their BUN is greater than seven millimoles or 19 milligrams per deciliter. Their respiratory rate is greater than or equal to 30. Their blood pressure is either less than 90 systolic or less than 60 diastolic, and their age is 65 or older. So a score of zero to one, you can treat outpatient. If it's three to five, then you definitely want to admit them to the hospital. And this will usually be like their immunocompromised the diabetics, the COPDs, or even like the alcoholic patients and so on. A score of two, that's like usually in the gray zone, so you have to really determine whether or not you want to admit them or not. So that's really up to you. So the treatment option outpatient is age dependent. So if they're less than 60, the first line outpatient therapy are macrolides like azithromycin or clarithromycin. They work by inhibiting protein synthesis by reversibly binding to the 50S ribosomal subunit and inhibiting transpeptidization. Transpeptidization. Ah, uh, goddamn, I can't say it. Transpeptidation, that. And translocation. So basically, the peptide chain can't grow longer, and the bacteria can't make proteins. So yeah, the bacteria's gonna die. And it's considered a bacteriostatic drug. For older patients, or those with comorbidities, or those that have failed treatment with macrolides, then you want to use fluoroquinolones. And they're the first line agent in this case. So like levofloxacin, moxifloxacin, they work by inhibiting the DNA gyrase, and that's just like the enzyme within the class of topoisomerases. Their job as a DNA gyrase is to prevent supercoils within the DNA. So since they can't do their job, you're gonna have too many supercoils and that's gonna increase the stress of the DNA. So eventually it's gonna break. For outpatient treatment, you will definitely treat them for five days and you don't want to stop until they've been afebrile for 48 hours. So for hospitalized patients, we can use fluoroquinolones alone or a third generation cephalosporin plus a macrolide. So say for example, ceftriaxone with azithromycin. So if you want to know how they work, cephalosporins are bactericidal. They disrupt the peptidoglycan layer of the cell wall by screwing up the final step which is involved with the penicillin binding proteins, aka PBPs. So these PBPs act like glue and stick the d diella to the neuropeptides to help cross-link the peptidoglycan layer. So the cephalosporins end up mimicking the d diella site. So the PBPs end up sticking to them instead and there's no stabilization of the cell wall and yeah, pretty much everything gets destroyed. So streptococcus pneumonia is also the number one cause of adult meningitis. So our meninges line the skull and vertebral canal and they enclose our brain and spinal cord. They consist of three layers, the dura matter, the arachnoid matter, and the pea matter. So patients with meningitis present with headaches, especially when they're lying down, fevers, nausea and vomiting. They can also have a stiff and painful neck. They may also complain about photophobia as well. 
On physical exam, you'll see some nuchal rigidity, and that just really means like a stiff neck. And they'll also have some difficulty flexing their spine because the meninges are inflamed. So you'll do a full neuro exam, and you'll also perform two tests. One of them is called the Kerning sign, and the other one is the Brudinsky sign. Brzezinski sign, yeah, I, I can't even pronounce it. So Kerning sign is just when you extend the knees of the patient with the hips flexed at 90 degrees. The patient will complain of some back or head pain when their legs are extended. And this just means that there's irritations of the meninges. Just remember to do this test on both legs. So if it's positive on both legs, then yeah, that's really bad. There's also the Brzezinski sign. Yeah, I can't pronounce it. Which also tests for meningeal irritation. So you tell the patient to relax and right when you passively flex their neck and their legs, their thighs will involuntary flex. So it pretty much looks like they're doing ab crunches. So we do a CT of the head without contrast first if the patient has neurological symptoms. We also want to rule out any space occupying lesions. The reason why it's without contrast is because if we add contrast, then we can't really tell the difference between like blood and contrast, so yeah. We also want to make sure that there's no increased intracranial pressure. So once we know all this, then we can do a lumbar puncture. So the fluid will look yellow with increased polymorphic nuclear cells and proteins and a decreased glucose level. And the lymphocyte count will be normal because remember this is a T helper 2 response because we're fighting against extracellular bacteria. The reason why these results are like that is because the bacteria are consuming our glucose and they're making their own proteins and waste. So that's why it's gonna look a little bit yellow. Just remember for the exams, if you expect it on clinical exam, then you can treat them right away. You're gonna give them IV antibiotics. And remember just to give this right before CT or LP, just to be on the safe end. So these patients will be admitted to the hospital. In the case of streptococcus pneumonia, we can give them three antibiotics together. A third generation cephalosporin like ceftriaxone with vincomycin and ampicillin for empiric treatment while we're waiting for the cultures and sensitivities. And just remember for the exam, all close contacts to the patient, like their family members, must receive prophylactic treatment of rifampin or ceftriaxone. It's usually gonna be rifampin for the exams, but but if you have to give subtraxone, it's just a one dose of intramuscular subtraxone. And just continue the analgesics in supportive therapy to reduce their fevers. So like the worst complication you can get is septicemia. And well, I mean, technically the worst complication is death, but anyway, septicemia is just when your blood is poisoned with all this bacteria and toxins and they start to destroy the linings of your blood vessels. And yeah, these are gonna cause like these large purple rashes on the skin from the leakage. Along with this, the oxygen supply of your body will start to decrease. So since the vital organs are usually perfused with more oxygen than the distal extremities, the distal extremities will start to become necrotic. And these patients usually require amputation of like their fingers, their hands, their toes. If it gets like really bad, then you might have to remove like their arms or legs. So yeah, definitely wanna watch out for that. So the final thing is that strep pneumonia is the number one cause of otitis media and sinusitis. So otitis media usually presents in children because they have a shorter, wider, and horizontal eustachian tube. So the bacteria can travel a shorter distance and yeah, they can just cause infection pretty easily. Kids usually present with ear pain, fevers, decreased hearing, especially if they have an effusion present in irritability. The parents might complain that they have problems with their speech and their language development is like falling behind because they can't hear. During the exam, you'll see the kid tugging on his ear and on the otoscope exam, you can see bulging of the tympanic membrane with a decreased mobility of the tympanic membrane. And the way we know if there's a decreased mobility is because if you ever go into the ENT office and look at their otoscopes, it's attached to this bulb and that bulb looks similar to like a blood pressure bulb and it just shoots out a little bit of air so if you put it inside someone's ear and you shoot out a little bit of air you should see some movement of the tympanic membrane and if you don't see any then you can suspect it so first line therapy is amoxicillin for 10 days amoxicillin with clavulinic acid augmentin is second line therapy if they keep getting these infections or they have like an effusion then you're gonna have to drain it with a procedure called a myringotomy and a tympanostomy tube Bleh. I can't even like pronounce that right. But basically it's just a tube. It's inserted into the tympanic membrane and it drains the effusion over time. And then the tube's just removed. So I just want to end with the pneumococcal vaccines. There are two types. There's a PCV13, which is a pneumococcal conjugated vaccine. And then there's also a PPSV23, which is a pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine, which is non-conjugated. So we give the PCV13 
the conjugated type to babies and like pretty much the pediatric population because kids less than five years old don't elicit a strong immune response to the capsule by itself because the body's like yeah this is just like an empty shell floating around why bother reacting to it so they only make igm but we want them to make more than igm so when the polysaccharide capsule is conjugated with a diphtheria toxoid then the body's like oh crap we better do something this isn't just like an empty shell anymore. In this way, the diphtheria toxoid acts like a haptin and elicits a stronger immune response. So in kids, IgM on the B cell eats up the polysaccharide with the haptin and it presents it to the T helper type two cells, which is like the CD4 cells by using its MHC2 receptor. And now that the type two T helper cell is involved, they can allow for isotype switching as well as memory development in the B cells. So now the B cells can make stronger immunoglobulins like IgG besides IgM and yeah, you have memory. So in adults, especially between the ages of 19 to 64, we give the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine 23, AKA the PPSV 23. If they are diabetic, like alcoholics or smokers, we need to give them both if they're high risk patients like CSF leakers, sickle cell patients, uh, patients who've had their spleen removed, uh, immunocompromised patients like HIV, and a rare one which I've seen them test like a few times is patients with cochlear implants. Patients older than 65 get one dose of PCV13 followed by PPSV23 6 to 12 months later. So just remember they're gonna get both. So yeah, this is Streptococcus pneumonia in a nutshell along with its complications. So now you know why it's number one. Thanks for watching guys. If you have any comments, suggestions, or anything else you'd like to see, just leave a comment below. Also, remember to like and subscribe. Subscribe. Okay, can't even pronounce that right. Alright, later.